uh, David McCullough, famous historian, has said well, we've raised a generation of uh, people that are uh, functionally illiterate when it comes to history. Now that may not apply to you, I'm not saying it does, but a general in America, we're raising uh, students that don't know history the way they should. And, and let me tell you the biggest concern I see is when you see a good percentage of college graduates graduating from college <clears throat> who think they would like socialism. And uh, you know, I kind of shake my head because here it is in a nutshell. The whole what we've seen because of America, and you know, I want you to realize what the, the, the basis of uh, the foundation was. First of all, let me just kind of share with you a couple things that uh, that uh, that I like to do. And, uh, if you go to the Declaration of Independence, okay, and, 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 he, and they say uh, that first of all, that when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for the people to dissolve for political bands which they have connected when, with another, and to assume among the powers of earth the separate and equal station of which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, okay? A decent respect to the opinions of mankind re requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation, all right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created with equal, that they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now listen to this. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So what's the purpose of government? Secure those rights. The purpose of government is to secure God-given rights. Okay? And the, the, the whole idea of when our founding fathers began was this, that they wanted to have a government that provided the maximum amount of freedom that was commensurate with having some sort of civil government. In other words, if you have no government, you just have lawlessness, okay? That's what you have. You have to have some form of government to put uh, boundary lines and stuff like that. But the government was never intended to run your lives. All right? And that's why uh, one of the things that I encourage people to do is, let me tell you, that's the Declaration of Independence. That's the, that's the Constitution. And, you know, then a little added on to boot. And that's how small it is. I, I mean, I wasn't... You know, I'm, academics was not my my big forte. I, as I told people when I graduated from high school, I said I, I graduated in that portion of the class that made the 50 percent, the other 50 percent look good. And so I said, you know what? And yet, when I went to college, I did not need remedial math, and I didn't re need remedial English. Okay. And so uh, that, that's one because here it is in a nutshell. That form of government which gave us uh, that freedom, has given us the most prosperous country in the world. The free enterprise system has pulled more people out of poverty than any other system. Because of America, many of these countries, in order, when you see these, these disasters happen, who do they look for? They look for America. When they look for uh, problems in the world, they look for America to solve it. One of the reasons we're able to do that is because we are so prosperous. All right? The poor in America are more likely to have a bigger roof over their head, eat more meat, eat more food in general, more likely to have a television set, more likely to have a car than the middle-income people in the next richest country in the world. And yet, and then you look at well, what's going on right now in this way? They were, you know what? At one time, they were the third richest country in this hemisphere. 
And today, their people are eating out of garbage cans. And you know why? They first said, well, you know what? We think we're going to go for a nationalized health insurance system. They went to this nationalized health insurance system, and what happened was they continued down that road, and guess what? Today, they're eating out of garbage cans. They, they, they went full bore socialism. And because as Margaret Thatcher said, the reason socialism doesn't work is eventually you run out of other people's money. And so uh, if, if you look at some of the, the health systems they're talking about, they're saying, oh, well, that, that will only cost $10 trillion <laughs> right now, you know, the, 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 uh, Budget in the United States is four trillion dollars, but the healthcare system would cost ten. Okay. I, when I came out of the healthcare system, and I told people, I said, you know what? What I, I started in the healthcare system actually in 1967 when I went into the military, and I said, uh, the more the government got involved, the worse it got. And when they really messed it up real good, they wanted to take over. We're going the wrong direction. Because here it is in a nutshell. See that? Your iPhone, that was developed because of the free enterprise system. The free enterprise system works this way. People get out there, they develop products, and then they buy for the dollars that you have. And you and you alone are the only one that decides whether you're going to buy that product. And the end result is they're going to make products that go up and down the spectrum. There'll be inexpensive ones, there'll be expensive ones. There'll be classy ones, and there'll be the, just uh, the standard ones. That's the free enterprise system. Okay? Because they're constantly looking to ways to make the product better, cheaper, or whatever, because you and you alone are the only one to just decide whether you're going to buy it or not. No one's going to force you to buy that product. And because of that, they're constantly seeking for better ways to entice you to get that product. And so, uh, when someone says, we're going to come up with a single-payer health system, believe me, <laughs> it's going to be, you're going to pay for it, and is there, there's no saying. Uh, nothing gets so expensive until it's free. Because it may be free to some people, but believe me, someone has to pay the ticket. So, uh, I, I want you to watch. Well, that's why it's important to understand the principles on which we were founded upon so that you will earn, learn them so you won't make the mistakes of people who don't know why we were created the uh, the foundation of it and that kind of thing. The other thing is is that uh, tyrants very often use the, uh, the, the the lack of knowledge of people to get control. An informed populace is very difficult to control. So that's why in many cases they say, well, you know, oh, history isn't important or something like that. And there's a dumbing down of history or an attempt to in many cases. And so that's why it's important for you to understand the foundation of this country. Because let me tell you something. Uh, we still live in the greatest country in the world. Do we have problems? Yes, we do. It's just like I've told people, I said, you know what? The, the free enterprise system has some problems in it. The deal is, it's just a whole lot better than whatever, whatever is there in second place. Okay? So, uh, let me kind of go through a couple of, if I can real quick address some of what, what I call the myths of uh, the Constitution and the founding and that kind of thing. First of all, how many of y'all have, have ever heard, well, you know, the majority of the founding fathers were atheists. They were deists. They were, you know, some, something like you've heard that to some degree or another. Okay. Okay. Uh, let, me, uh, let 
Let me share with you a couple things. Because you, now, usually when they talk about that, uh, now, what we typically try to do is, okay, we're going to agree with you. There's two people that are the, the founding fathers that most people would agree would be the most irreligious of the founders. Okay, most irreligious. And uh, one of them would be, of course, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, now, Jefferson, of course, wrote the Declaration of Independence where he's talking about, you know, the laws of nature and nature is God. He's talking about God-given rights, that our rights come not from government, they come from God. All right. Now, so most people say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't think we would call him an atheist. And I don't think we could, we could call him uh, a deist. Because, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, they, they're asking for prayer and things like that for the government to secure these God-given rights. Uh, ben Franklin, when, when they first got started on the Constitution in 1787, they, they, they said uh, we were having trouble getting people to agree on things. You know, there was argument and all this other stuff. And so Ben Franklin says, stands up at the uh, Constitutional Convention and he says words to this, this effect. He says, when, when, when we were at war with, with, great, with great Britain, he said we would routinely meet here to pray. And he said, have we forgotten this friend of ours that helped us through the war? I mean, here they were, uh, a ragtag group uh, of, of, by and large, uh, civilians taking on the strongest military might in the world, and they defeated them. And he said, we prayed for his assistance, and he came through. Didn't use it in that word, but... He that's what he, what he said. And then he said, and if a sparrow cannot fall without his notice, where did he get that? <clears throat> he got that out of the Bible. <clears throat> then neither can countries prosper without his help. And, I, and so what he said is we need to call on him now to help us to resolve our differences. What happened? They stopped. They prayed for the next three days. They came back and they wrote the Constitution. Now, you know, I don't think you can call him an atheist, and I don't think you can call him a deist. Because a deist believes that uh, they start the, uh, the, the, the universe off, God starts it off, spins it, and then goes to take a nap. Doesn't get involved in the affairs of men. And yet, the second most irreligious of the founding fathers, a lot of the others, they started Bible... Uh, 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 the American Bible societies and things like that. They were uh, presidents of uh, theological schools and things like that. To, to say that there, there wasn't an atheist or deist in the group, I can tell you that. <clears throat> the, uh, the other thing is, is this. You hear this phrase, separation of church and state? Okay. Uh, let me... Uh, share with you. <clears throat> this is the first of them. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free practice thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. You don't hear a word in there about separation of church and state. Where they got that was Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptist, or the Danbury Baptist wrote a letter to him. And they were concerned because uh, uh, that, that what would happen then at that moment what had happened in Europe. And in Europe what they had was government and the church, a, a particular church, got together. 
And so this is why they wrote the First Amendment. What they wanted to prevent was a church of the United States. They did not, on the other hand, want to secularize society in any way, shape, or form. In fact, every one of the founding fathers, uh, let me give you a few prime examples. When they began the first Congress, one of the things they did was they had a congressional clergyman. House, Senate, first paid members of Congress. The other thing is they began their congressional sessions with a prayer just like we do. Okay? And uh, the other thing was that they often had, uh, in those days, at the time when Thomas Jefferson was president, they often had uh, church meetings in the Capitol. And what would happen is they would actually have various churches from time to time would come and meet in the Capitol. That's where they began their uh, church services, in the Capitol. And they not only had them in the Capitol, they had them in a number of other government buildings. Okay? So, because they understood exactly what I was talking about with the Declaration of Independence, that God had been involved in this nation. And they weren't about to say, now we're going to remove him from everything we do. Okay. What they wanted to prevent was a church in the United States. Uh, so, while we were on the First Amendment, let's go, go to the second. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, a lot of people want to zero in, well, they, you know, they were talking about militia. We don't have militias these days, so we don't need... No, 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 no. It says, this is important, but for that reason, the right of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed upon. Because I want to tell you, they understood one thing very well. If they had been disarmed, Prior to the fight for independence, there would have been no fight for independence. There would have been none. Because they wouldn't have had the ability to defend themselves. And, and, and what they had at that time, by and large, was the, the military weapon of the day. It was a flintlock rifle. Right. And so they had that at that day because. The Second Amendment is not intended so that people go hunting on the weekend or during deer season or dove season, this season or whatever. The purpose of the Second Amendment is that no one ever gets the idea that they can overthrow we the will, we the people. Okay? Because I want to tell you this. When they talk about trying for people's guns, I want to tell you that if you study, that this is another reason why some people don't like to study history, because if you study history, you will find that every tyrant of the 20th century, what they did was first they said, well, we're going to, we're going to take away your guns because of safety. You, know, we, you need safety out there, so we're going to take away your guns. And the very next step was after they had taken away their guns, they began to murder millions of their own unarmed citizens. Adolf Hitler did that. Nazi Germany. Yeah. Sir, uh, you're jumping into the meat of what we were talking about right before you arrived. Okay. Uh, I have a student here who is also from Australia. Okay. And we were quizzing him about the confiscation of guns in Australia. And uh, on your, you know, new, the news right now is the latest shooting at a Pee Wee softball game in Fort Worth. Uh, mass shootings everywhere. This young man, raise your, raise your hand please, uh, is from Australia. And he said they confiscated all guns and they don't longer have mass shootings. So, I mean, how, how, do, we, how, how do we balance that? How do we balance? I, I know Nick's in the crowd and Nick's a libertarian. And so, how, you know, how do we balance that, the, the uh, free society that's, that, that can overthrow the government with mass shootings, I mean, I mean, it's a it's a quandary. I mean, and we've yeah. discussed freedom, order, and equality in this class. Yeah. So, when does someone's order interfere with somebody's freedom to own a gun? You know, that that kind of stuff. Uh, I, let me, get to yours, let me answer this first, and then we'll get to yours. Uh, here it is in a nutshell. 
Uh, what, what I've told people is this. Look, we all want uh, uh, basically safe societies. But you, you got to ask, how do we get there? Okay. Now, I believe the way to get there is to have the easiest access of, to guns of the, the, uh, uh, the law-abiding citizens. You, you allow, allow the law-abiding citizens to have easy access to guns, and guess what? You're going to have a safer society. Now, you're going to say, well, but what's about... Let me tell you something right now. What happened in middle Odessa and then El Paso, okay, and one weekend happens every weekend in Chicago. Okay, the difference is the media doesn't talk about it. That many people die every weekend in Chicago. Every weekend, where they have the toughest gun laws in the country. You know why, friends? Because guess what? Just like in Australia, law-abiding citizens turned in their guns. Criminals didn't. So who ends up with the guns? The criminals. The other thing is, is this. More people are murdered every year by knives that are killed by AK-47s or AR-15s or whatever. And I'm sorry, those are not military weapons. The military weapon of today is a fully automatic weapon. There are no fully automatic that is That is against the law. The, the, the AR-15 was the weapon in Vietnam, but the bolt-action weapon was the weapon in World War II. The breech loader was the weapon in the, during the Civil War. And the flintlock was... The, so if you're going to say, a weapon of war, guess what? Are we Okay, which war are we going to talk about? If we're going to talk about, you know, any war, then the flintlock was at one time a weapon of war. Nick, you want to say something? But the deal is, is that, probably. that, guess what? If the other side has fully automatics and you have a plant lock, there will be no war. There, there will be, uh, it will be the same as being unarmed, quite frankly. And uh, what they never talk about is the number of people that have defended themselves from breaking and entering or any other crime because they were armed. Uh, how many of y'all have ever shot a shotgun? Okay. How many of y'all have ever shot an AR-15? Which one would you say was the easiest to shoot? AR-15. There you go. I mean, you know, I know we've had one politician say, well, just go out there in the front porch and fire your shotgun. You know, if you're worried, just go out on the front porch and fire your shotgun. But let me tell you, a lot of women, you know, and a lot of men handle a shotgun because it has a whole lot more kick to it than AR-15. And, uh, you know, if you've got somebody coming through the front door, you don't want to have, well, uh, well i got a three-round clip. I better make it good. And, and you know what? One of the, why, why did we do that? We passed a law called the Castle Doctrine. that said if somebody invades your home, you have the right to use deadly force. And you know what? When you pass laws like that, guess what happens? Crime comes down. You know why? Because say people say <laughs> those people there may have a gun, and so therefore, what do they do now? They try and do everything possible to make sure you're not at home when they break into the house. What the, what the deal is now is they go up to the front door, they ring the doorbell, they'll wait for a minute. Nobody answers the door. They go back to the car. They'll drive around for five, ten minutes. They come back ten minutes later. They'll, well, they might have been on, on the commode or they might have been in the shower or whatever. I'm going to ring the doorbell again. They ring the doorbell again. If it doesn't answer the second time, they, you know, they, the possibility of somebody being home is very low at that point. At that point, I mean, they literally kick down the door. Because they don't believe someone's at home. And then they get their face on camera because they got the ring doorbell. That's right. That's why, I, man, I've got, I got a, I, <laughs> I've got a ring doorbell, <laughs> and I've got cameras in the house, and you know that's why, you know they, they what they look at is opportunities. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a burglar alarm, and you don't have a ring doorbell or something like that, 
They're going to say, okay, I would rather go to the one that doesn't than the one that does. So, uh, but, uh, now, go ahead. Uh, first, if I may be so bold to correct just a factual statement. It is perfectly legal for a citizen of the United States to own a machine gun made prior to 1986, provided that individual is willing to pay the $200 excise stamp to the ATF. So that is actually the law. I own one. I also, before I ask this question so that we're all on the same page and there's no hidden questions, I am a member of the firearm industry of a manufacturing facility here in Weatherford. That being said, I am curious to know how long you think the right will survive this argument while at the same, this argument that, well, we should do nothing effectively to combat the increased number of shootings, particularly the type that we've seen in El Paso, mm -hmm. that we've seen in Odessa, that we see at the churches and the schools, um, and survive the callous response, this is simply the reality of a pro-Second Amendment uh, world because I don't at some know point anybody that said that at some point my concern for the gun industry and I am obviously speaking from this position yep. is is that the continued it's a mental health issue and refusal to address anything will result in an eventual shift of political alignment in the United States mm -hmm. and these things will simply be banned and that'll be the end of it yeah. There'll be a law, and then at that point, the right is going to have to presume that citizens of the United States are willing to pick up their rifles and point them at law enforcement, at the military, at family, at whomever to secure that right. And uh, I'm just curious if that's very I, realistic. I think you've kind of gone down a path that, uh, you know, uh, here, here that I, you know, I agree with you. And I, I don't know anybody that has said, oh, you know, we don't care whether there's a few mass shootings out there. Uh, here's what I, my philosophy is. First of all, we need to look at what are the similarities? There are a lot uh, between, among all these mass shooters. There are some real similarities. First of all, uh, was law enforcement notified many times that there's a problem? Yes, they did. But there wasn't the communication, just like uh, prior to 9-11, there wasn't a communication between the FBI and the Homeland Security agencies, uh, CIA and that kind of thing. Uh, th 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 there wasn't a communication. So one of the things we've said is, and that's one of the things that Governor Abbott has done, uh, looking, trying to improve, is the communication. Because many times there was a, people were notified that, hey, we got somebody out here that, uh, well, the, the guy in from Plano had uh, a kill list, he had a rape list. You know, how many lists does a guy got to have before somebody starts paying attention and says, you know, we need to jump on this? Uh, but uh, the, the other thing is, second of all, we need to enforce the laws we have. Uh, third, and it's just like the school shootings, we are doing something. You know, that uh, what we have found is one of the similarities of all the shooters is invariably they want to they want to go to gun free zones okay they want to go to a gun free zone so that's why they were going to schools schools were universally gun free zones plus usually they had some kind of vendetta in school or something like that but here's what it is do you know that israel used to have that problem they used to have the problem of people coming and shooting up the schools so they said you know what we're going to arm the teachers. So they arm the teachers, they arm the, the staff, and guess what? It stopped. Why? Because what do you know about uh, most mass shooters? The one from uh, Middle and Odessa was a little bit different tack. But most of them, the minute they run into an armed person, they do one of two things. They either run or they shoot themselves. That's the similarities there. Are there a few outliers? Yes, there are. But you know what? One of the other things that, that people have failed to address, and that's this. This may rankle a few feathers. But when I was growing up, it, it, was, it was normal that when I'd go to school, a lot of times my friends and I, would, we'd say, okay, we're going to go bird hunt tomorrow. So that, 
that the next day I put my gun in the car, drive to school with my gun in the trunk, and after school we put our guns all in one car and we'd all go bird hunting together. And we were in the city, in the rural areas. When I went to college, we had that we had people showed up at school with gun racks. They had a gun in the rack in, the, in their truck. Okay. Now, here's the deal. You know, so my point is, is this. Today, to carry a gun to school is a felony. Right? Now, we changed that into colleges. We said, you can have a concealed weapons license and have a gun. And you can take it to college. Okay? Uh, but, the point is, when I went to school, the guns were easily accessed than they are today. You know what, though? I, I, in fact, I can still remember the time that I got <laughs> got in an altercation with a, with a senior, and you know, I was I was a junior, and what it boils down to is he cold cocked me. You know, when I I, I kind of fallen, he, he uh, we tripped, and it was kind of we tripped together. And as I was coming up, he'd already gotten up. By the time I got up, uh, all of a sudden I turned around and I, I saw his fist in my face. Now, you know what? For whatever reason, I, I never thought about, well, you know, I'm going to go up to my car and I'm going to blast this guy. Didn't think of it. Now, so, just a second. Here's my question for you. What has happened to our society that has created it? monsters. And that is the question that no one wants to ask. Because I'll tell you this. Let me, let me tell you what the norm was when I was growing up. It was not unusual for us to begin school days with a prayer. It was, it was the norm that very often the Ten Commandments hung in the, in the school. You know, little words like thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Uh, the degradation from Hollywood. In fact, I can still remember. I can still remember the one-eyed Jackson. Y'all you know, you know, never heard of it, I'm sure. This is like in the late fifties. I mean, Marlon Brando. He was a cowboy. I, I mean, they had shooting back and forth. Nobody. You didn't see any blood. No guts. All this other stuff. But the other thing was, you know what? The 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 the. the Foul language of those days was when he called his uh, the bad guys, you pool of spit. You scum sucking pig. You know, we didn't have a lot of the words that they have in movies today. That I believe is not there enough. It's not to improve the movie or anything like that, it's to degrade society. And uh, but finally the is this is that we have not accepted. In other words, in, in our, when I was going to school, there was a belief in the ultimate uh, sanctity of human life. That we have not accepted the premise of the relative value of human life. Is that something we ought to be paying attention to? <laughs> but we haven't accepted the premise of the relative value of human life. Okay? What I'm talking about is, is this. We accepted the, 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 the we accepted the, the, the premise of the relative value of human life when we accepted the premise that if the unborn child is wanted, it has value. But if the unborn child is not wanted, it has all the value of you. And so I want to tell you that was the other thing that was a fundamental change. We have more kids. The, the other thing is this. When I was growing up, I don't care what, what the race was, the number of kids born out of wedlock was about 5%. Depends on where you are, it can range, and I'm talking about in the city or whatever, it can range anywhere from uh, 20, 30, 40, to set up to 70% of children who want to find their weapon. And I want to tell you, when you have that many children without a dad in the home, 
there's going to be a problem. And I don't care, how, and there's a time that's going to happen, I don't care how, uh, you know, how well intentioned people were, there are going to be times it's going to be happening. That was the five percent. But the deal is that uh, when you get to be, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent, there's a problem. So I, I believe we're going to have to start looking at that before we ultimately achieve real safety in society. We've got to understand there's been a degradation of happening in the society and we start working to uh, reverse it. And then you have a question. Oh, no, I didn't have a question, but I just uh, wanted to state the fact that um, when you said that back then when you were in school, that you didn't think about, y'all brought, what is it, guns? Like, if my dad has told me before that he had, he remembered back in that time too, when he was in high school, that he had your gun on the rack yeah. in the back of your truck, oh, yeah. and they didn't say anything about no, it. No, that's exactly right. Nobody said a word. Yeah. Now, that was before we started having the mass shootings. Mm -hmm. And so, my point is, is this. It wasn't access to guns that created the problem. No. So, uh, and then I think you have another issue. <laughs> I have a lot of issues, but they're unrelated. Um, two, two, two things. One, I, I am puzzled how it is that you've concluded that the good old days involved no relative value of human life when... Southern society was predicated entirely on segregation, treating a secondary class of citizens as non-human until the federal government effectively forced that to be changed. So that is yeah, and a that relative was because value. Why? Why was that? I'm anxious to hear your response. Well, that's because that was the premise that the founding was based on our law. Even the founders who had slaves saw the evil of slavery, and their idea was that we would get, get, get to that point where we would eliminate slavery. That was the whole premise that all of them were uh, agreed upon. And as you recall, what happened was that culmination came with the election of Abraham Lincoln. The whole point of, uh, of the election at that time was slavery. And Abraham Lincoln was elected. Abraham Lincoln was the anti-slavery guy. Yes, but Abraham Lincoln, didn't, Abraham Lincoln didn't fix the, the, the issue of the relative valuation of black Americans in the United States. You know, look, uh, we, we can get to that because I'll tell you this. When he, when he signed the emancipation, uh, here, let's, let's first of all, look, because that gets another point of the Constitution here. Uh, because one of the other issues you'll hear is the Supreme Court is the final decision. You ever heard that? That's my decision. Well, the Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott decision that black people would forever be slaves. They would never be citizens. And in essence, that's the way it was. What happened? I mean, because we, we don't have slaves today. What happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Abraham Lincoln read the uh, opinion of the Supreme Court and said, thank you very much, I appreciate your opinion, but I disagree. And at that point he signed the Emancipation Proclamation and both the House and the Senate signed the 13th and 14th Amendment to the Constitution. And so that changed. Now, in fact, to go back a little further. Uh, because after that time, then what happened was there was an attempt to thwart what was what, what had happened. And uh, one of the things that had been done was, guess what they did? They came up with gun laws. And what was the purpose of gun laws in many cases? It was to keep blacks from being able to defend themselves when it came to the Ku Klux Klan. Because the Ku Klux Klan at that time, later on, rose up. It, it got kind of its zenith in the early 1900s. But a lot of the gun laws were designed to keep African Americans from being able to arm themselves, defend themselves from the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, basically, uh, we. Uh, uh, Forget, for continued progress because during Woodrow Wilson was a time when there was a setback in 
the, uh, the civil rights movement, quite frankly. Because what had happened was, he was the one that decided we're going to segregate the military after it had already been integrated. And the other thing was that he was the one that uh, had uh, the movie Birth of a Nation shown in the White House. I don't know, have y'all ever heard of Birth of a Nation? That, that, was, that, was, that was the movie about the greatness of the Ku Klux Klan. That was shown in the White House under Woodrow Wilson's administration. So, uh, you know, that's been a, uh, uh, just like with, with, with the issue of abortion, you know, there's still a fight going on. And uh, there was also under uh, the issue of uh, equality of the races. But you know what? If, if you read, just like I said, you read the Declaration of Independence, nowhere does it say uh, all men are created equal, except if you're black or if you're Hispanic or any other race. It said all men are created equal. And we had people of every race here. So they understood that, and that's what they intended. The, the, it was, this is what we see as our goal. This is what we want to strive for. And so, uh, uh, it, is it perfect? Uh, right now, we're not perfect. But you know what? I'll tell you this. Try doing some of the things that you want to do here in just about any other country in the world. It, it's one, like one of these things where uh, we have people who are constantly picking at small things here, totally ignoring what goes on in many other countries. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that they ought to be our standard. But my point is this. Uh, our goal ought to be this is the way we improve things, not here's the evil of America. Yeah. Um, as a, uh, with all due respect, uh, you, you have unleashed a lot of factual and non-factual statements, and this being an academic institution, and these students here, what is wrong with civil discourse? Why don't we just, uh, instead of giving information of the past, why don't you allow the students to engage you in conversation? Okay. So that you can see their point uh, of view. Hey, 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 they raise their hands. I'm, rather, I'm, rather, rather than just imposing your thoughts and your beliefs on them, let them share their views with you. And that's how we start a civil discourse okay. as an academic institution. That's why we train them. Okay. To become the future leader. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I usually, you know, I talk until somebody raises their hand, and then when somebody raises their hand, I acknowledge it. But you know what? Uh, so please, if you've got a question, make no mistake about it. I'm, I'm ready to let's let's talk. Students, you, it's yeah. your, it's your game. Why don't you ask some questions? How you feel and how, where are you coming from? It's free. It's freedom of speech. <laughs> then it's your time to ask questions. Yes. Yeah. How are you? How are you? What's your view on fixing gun control? What's the way to fix it? Well, well yeah. Uh, my fix would be again. Because this is the first time hearing him like talking to Australia about how to get guns away, and then everything seems to be working out. It just seems like. Well, this no, 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 no. I don't think that. I don't think that's what he said. Did you say everything's working out? No problem. Um, we have no Okay, let me ask you this. How is, how is violence in general? Okay. In today's age, <coughs> more like bullying is, is happening less now. Like we're all kind of in the right. classroom. Like she could say she doesn't like my shirt, I could say I don't like her shirt, but we're still going to yeah. communicate about that and not. I feel like this generation is more about. Equality and loving each other, and you know, everyone's equal. Back then, it was more like, yeah, segregated. And it's different now that I think, I, I don't know how to fix mass shootings or anything like that, but I think it, 
add put these splits on our data ultra, which if it works there, I mean, like you said, history kind of tells us how to how things work. Well, maybe, maybe it works now. I, I, I would like to look at that, and I'll tell you why. I've heard, yeah, they haven't had any more mass shootings, but they still have. Uh, um, um, the crime rate has gone up because when you unarm, there's no doubt about it. The people who hand over their guns are law-abiding citizens. The people who don't hand over their guns are, are criminals. And the idea that uh, somehow you can uh, curtail crime uh, by you know just having people hand over their guns. Uh, in, in, a, in a free society, now you can have it in like uh, China, Russia, where you have oppressive societies because, you know, they're kind of coming and kicking in the doors and everything else like that. But in, in free societies, uh, it's like I say, all I, all I do is look and say, compare what happens here in Texas and Chicago. And I want to tell you this. If you don't think the media has a, um, the, the, if you don't think the media in this country has an agenda, a narrative that they're pushing, it's, it's just like, why don't they tell us what goes on every weekend in Chicago? I'll tell you why. It is a city that has the toughest gun laws in the country, as well as the fact that it has been run by progressive for years. And it's just like Baltimore and many others that have been run by progressives for years. And it's an indication that, you know what? Most people say, gee, when I see what goes on there, when I see what goes on in Houston or Dallas or San Antonio or whatever, I think I'll take Houston, Dallas, or San Antonio. But. Oh, um, so I, I don't understand why you keep saying that uh, when they, people who give up their, like if they came in and said that we had to give up our guns. So the people who give up their guns are law-abiding citizens, but people who don't are criminals. I don't agree with that. Well, well I'm not a criminal, but I'm not going to give up my guns. Well, no, no, no. My, my point is that in general that's what happens. So, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you're right. In America, they had a tough time. It, it, it's going to be a tough road to hoe before they start coming in and taking these guns. Because we were born uh, in this, this idea of God-given rights. I have a God-given right to defend myself. And I have, I have a right to defend myself with a gun. You know, I'm, I'm not going to use a pea shooter or, you know, a pop gun. So, uh, because guess what? That doesn't defend you. But, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. You're, and you're right. In America, they would have trouble coming in because why? We have a Second Amendment. Most other nations never were, you know, founded under those premises. They haven't gone through what we've gone through. And there's, uh, you know, when, and, and by the way, let me have you know, when, uh, when uh, one of the things y'all were talking about was just being able to talk to one another, okay? You may, and listen, I'm all in favor of open discussions and disagreements. I say, you know, in fact, I, I've told people, I say, anytime somebody says, uh, the debate's over, case closed, or what, beware. Because, you know what, they don't want to debate it. Or when they say, uh, 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 well, let me give you another. When you go to campuses and you have one group trying to shut down another group, you know, they show up on campus and then, uh, you know what, if you allow them to come, we're going to create violence. Okay? Because they have hate speech or something like that. Be aware of that kind of stuff. Because anytime they're afraid of open and free debate, you want to go... Now listen, I, for years I've said... If somebody wants to believe in socialism, get up on stage. I'm ready to take them on. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say the debate's over with. You know why? Because I think I have the facts on my side. And the same thing would do with gun control or whatever. Because, but, who is shutting down the debates that you know? When you go to colleges, who are they trying to shut down? 
No. But, uh, no, they're, they're trying to shut Not down. Not here. They're trying to shut down. No, you're right. They don't do it here. God bless you. <laughs> but in many, but in many schools, they try to shut down the conservative voice. That's what they try to shut down. So. Uh, that was more liberal than like not. Like, what is it? Yeah, uh, you know, I, hey, listen, you're invading my, uh, you know, my uh, safety zone. I can't hear, you know, somebody with a different deal. I've never been that way. And you know what? And, and I, I think free, open debates and stuff like that, that's that's one of the greatness of America. That was, uh, you know, that was one of the things that we were founded on, is being able to freely open debate. So, what, you had something else? Yeah, so, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I was just thinking, like, I guess the difference would be with Chicago, like, if their gun laws are really that tough, like, couldn't you just drive a couple of hours to another state, yeah. and then you'd be sort of kind of thing? Well, exactly. He may, he, he, yes. Let me just follow up on what you just said. That's a very factual statement. The fact that Chicago have the toughest law, the guns are coming from the neighboring states, Indiana, and the other states neighboring to them, and that's what the politicians in the other on the other side of you have been talking about. But nobody wants to address it. The very moment you address a national gun law, those guns from the neighboring states will stop flowing into Chicago. It's not because people in Chicago have the gun in there, and the, we give one side of the story to make our story look good. Chicago, the guns are not coming from there. It's coming from somewhere else. Just like we talk about drugs in America, where do drugs, drug drug drugs come from? Drug makers. Mexico. Where? Mexico. Where, 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 where? Mexico. Okay. Okay. But, but how many people? Why? How many people in Mexico are addicted to drugs? Because we have an insatiable task for the drugs. That's why it's flowing here. Right. It's not, so, isn't, isn't, <laughs> sir, with all due respect, isn't there isn't the conclusion to your argument though? It's not where they're manufactured, whether it be drugs or guns, but where the demand is, and isn't the exactly. demand then in Chicago? It's not it's what you know. In well, Chicago. that's true, though. The demand is certainly higher in the state of Texas, <laughs> yeah. and I reject the idea that that this is a function of the progressives because the increase in mass shootings in the state of Texas is measurable, and Republicans have been in charge for 30 years. So if we're going to lay the fault for the, if they're going to lay the fault for what's happening in Chicago at the feet of the progressives, then we're going to have the same problem in the state of Texas. Well, may I, here's the deal. First may of all, I, may uh, I say something? Yeah, sir? Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, in 2017, there were 25,000 gun deaths in Mexico. In 2017, there were 17,000 gun deaths in the United States of America. And Mexico has very, very stringent gun laws. It's very hard to get a gun uh, in Mexico. And you look at Japan during all these times, over a 20-year period, they have only a handful of gun deaths. And they don't allow guns. So where, where do we go from this? Um, in, in the United States, uh, we want to have guns, and and all the shootings are in gun-free zones. Where do we go? I don't know the answer. With all due, with all due respect, uh, as an academic, as an, an educational institution, when we give statistics, you have to make sure that your stats are comparable. You are talking about uh, uh, um, crimes associated with gangs and drug dealers and not innocent citizens. Well, we have, me, ga we me, have gangs in the United States and we have gangs in Mexico. What happened in El Paso, there were some, there were some open carry people in the, in the store, in Walmart. What happened? They all ran away when the guy came out with, a, 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 uh, with his automatic rifle. They ran away. When you are talking about statistics in Mexico, it's more about the drug dealers. When you're talking about Chicago, it's about the gangs. We are talking about innocent citizens. Gangs that are dealing in drugs. Innocent citizens. I love it. Wait, 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 if you're saying only innocent, uh, only drug dealers get shot in, in Chicago, that's false. Lots of innocent people were murdered in Chicago. Gang related. 
And innocent people fell victim. You, you know, when you say they're gang related, gang yeah. Uh, two gangs maybe down, driving down the street and they'd be shooting at each other or something like that. But you know what? Innocent civilians are being shot and killed. And you know what? Because the law abiding citizens are disarmed in Chicago. That's, That's it in a nutshell. And, and, and here, to, let me give you another stat to try and disprove this one. And that is, is this crime among concealed weapons carriers. People who go and get a concealed weapons license. Crime among those people is nil. It is like the same as you have with a law enforcement officer. So what does it tell you? You know what? The more you arm the law-abiding citizens, the safer the place will be. No, it just tells us those people don't want to go to jail for committing a crime as a carrier. It doesn't, con that, that, that's, a, that's a false analogy to suggest that because people who go through the process of being licensed don't commit crimes, that people who own guns, legally, whatever that looks like, won't commit crimes. The guy well, that well, shot the, people the, no, the point in Odessa, is. Odessa, and Odessa purchased those guns through legal means. Well, the, the deal is, both of them, first of all, should have been caught earlier. But here, here's the thing, I'm gonna tell you that, yeah, uh, I, I may not be able to commit all, uh, stop all crimes, but I'll tell you this, it's just like when we put it's just like when we started putting uh, uh, and saying that a staff in a school could get a concealed weapons license and carry a gun, we believe you're going to see the mass shootings there be driven down significantly. When we, and uh, uh, when we start dealing with the issues other than trying to confiscate guns, uh, than uh, like, what are, the, what are the similarities? You admitted yourself that one of the problems is that the, the fact that we have people that are on uh, psychotropic drugs and they're getting access to guns. I'll agree with that. We, we ought to stop that. Uh, you know, uh, the deal is that I, I don't think there's a thing that we can do it as a state that has to be done nationally. And uh, I don't think anybody is opposed to people who are on psychotropic drugs being denied big guns. So, uh, you know, we, we can do a whole lot to uh, uh, eliminate, you know, every one of these mass shooters just by doing this. The, uh, uh, so, but we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs>